Welcome to Casas. We're excited you've chosen to spend your morning with us. Today, we will be concluding our series, Baseline. Our hope is that you've had the opportunity to learn something new and have become more confident in the good news that Jesus is all you need. If you're visiting us for the first time today, we're glad you're here. We ask that you text the word guest to the number below because we'd love the opportunity to connect with you. Also, if you haven't yet, be sure to stop by our Welcome Center. We have a small gift for you and we'd like to meet you. You'll also receive a welcome card. We ask that you fill that out and either return it to the Welcome Center or drop it in the giving boxes in the back of the room. One of our deeply held values here at Casas is loving others. This isn't always an easy thing to do, but if Jesus is the one you pursue, if His ways are yours, then loving others has a purpose and plan. Let's extend love to one another today as God awakens that in our hearts this morning. Whether you're joining us in person or online, we're glad you're here. Thanks for joining us today and welcome home. Good morning, Casas. It's so great to see you all. Why don't you all stand and let's worship together this morning. Your love is stronger, your love awakens away. 
Amen. Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Stacy, and I'm the student ministry pastor here at Cassis Church. And before you grab your seats, I'm gonna ask, I know, saw you. Before you do that, if you would turn to your neighbors, and I don't just want you to say hi this morning, I have an important question. Please ask them if they have seen the latest Top Gun movie. You gotta ask, have the people around you seen Maverick? That's upsetting. It's okay. Fix it. Okay. All right. Some of you just learned some difficult news like I did. Abel hasn't seen it yet. Some of you just found out some difficult news about the people around you. Go ahead, you can grab a seat now. Now we're ready for you, because we're gonna hang out for a while. If you haven't seen it, in Stacy's humble opinion, the only bad thing to come out of that movie is the mustache is definitely gonna come back in style. It's the only thing that I'm like, okay, that's cool. So, you know, it's fun, think about it. Um, I promise we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna continue um, with songs in a few minutes here. But right now, we're gonna continue in worship by stepping into a time of giving. And if you don't know this, we have a few opportunities to go ahead and give here. We have some boxes in the back by those sort of half walls as well as on these side doors. And we also have ways to go ahead and give online. And if you've ever been at Cassis before, you've probably heard someone up on this stage thank the people of this church for being so generous with their gifts because you are an incredibly generous church. But I don't know if we always come back up and share some stories of what your gifts are doing here in this church and in this community. And I actually have the opportunity to do that because I just got to take about 80 people over to California for a week to do high school camp. We took about 60 teenagers from our incoming freshmen yeah, I know, they're excellent humans. And also up to our graduating class for 2022. And we actually stay just outside of LA at Cal Baptist University. So the students get to stay in the dorms and kind of run the campus. And guys, it's so much fun. It's chaos, but we go to the beach. We go to this giant water park amusement ride place and we play something um, called broom ball. And if you ever wanna see a teenage girl get like weirdly competitive, just put them on the ice and they will shock you with what they'll do. And then we played ridiculous games. I had the students make um, airplanes out of cardboard and the winner actually was such a big airplane. It took three people up on stage to go ahead and throw it into the audience, but they won, so it was worth it. We played a game that our very own incoming freshman, Dominic over here, won. And all I said is, bring me hair from Ryan Kramer's head and you get a candy bar. And Dominic nearly pulled all of his hair out, but he won and he got a candy bar. So now you know, teenagers will do anything <laughs> for a candy bar. And then, like I said, we had these incoming freshman boys and they decided to start a prank war from the first day with our graduating class of boys. And so that lasted the whole week, pulled everybody from the trip in. And yes, all the freshmen came back in one piece. They didn't win the war, but they all made it home. So that's good. But like, yeah, it was a great week. It was chaotic, but there's always this other side to camp also. Like Lizette and Abel are this incredible brother-sister duo and they came to camp and they got to lead our kids. Yeah, absolutely. They got to lead our students in this acoustic worship. And it's just so meaningful to watch teenage stu students sing along to these songs and, and have these words spoken over them about how valuable they are, how seen they are, how much God loves them and how much that matters. And then Ryan Kramer, who's one of our pastors here, actually came and, and spoke to our students and spoke to them about how they are each uniquely made in God's image and how much this world needs them to step into that story, to step into the opportunities that God's putting in front of them and live their stories out loud. And it was just great to see that with students. And then we took about 16 incredible leaders like Elizabeth over here who are small group leaders with our teenagers. And they, um, they can be goofy, don't mishear me, but also, they pray with students and they pray for students and they lead them in these really important conversations that can change their whole lives. In fact, one student in particular, 
actually wrote me a letter and I wanted to share part of it with you guys because she didn't know until about Saturday morning. We had this random spot open up and she in 48 hours ended up being able to come to camp. She only knew one person. She had no idea what to expect, had never been to Cassis, had never met us. It was a whole thing. And she wrote this letter at the end of the week to sort of sum up what she experienced. And I just want to share part of it because she had shared how home wasn't necessarily the most encouraging place for her right now. But at this camp, I felt so connected and loved by everyone. I really felt like I could be myself. I've had such great conversations in my small group that I never have really been able to talk to anyone else about before. Although I didn't plan on coming until literally the last minute, I've enjoyed almost every second. Thank you all for the encouragement throughout the week. You made each and every day even better. I'm like, that is, that's a big deal. Right? For a 16, 17 year old girl who had no idea what was coming for her. And just be able to sum up and say, this is how important small groups and small group leaders and small group conversations got to be for me. And one thing I wanted to share is that it's not just for our, our students that this camp is such a big deal. One of our leaders um, who came on the trip, she actually has a little who's just over a year old. And then she's about six months pregnant with her next one. And she came on this camp and actually brought her little. So like, good on her. But she even got out on the ice and played broom ball with her little pregnancy belly. She is a beast. But she shared, and something I hadn't known until after camp, that she's been facing a lot of complexity with motherhood. She has just felt more isolated right now. Like there's more and more things in her world that she's not able to step into and do because she's got that little, because she's growing another one. And it's just been really difficult for her asking do I have to give up the things that matter to me because I've chosen motherhood? And this is what she shared. She said, once again, Cassis reassured me that I have a place and I belong, even if I'm a mom. The love and support that Cassis shows families cannot be overlooked, and I want to let you know that it was not taken lightly by this mama. There are not enough words to describe how amazing it feels to be a part of this community. And I get it, like, I love your guys' applause. Like, you feel this. Because what's so fun about that is she doesn't just mean me, she doesn't just mean Lizette and Abel and Elizabeth, she means this community because so many of you pray for those students. Let us have those kids for the week to take them to camp. You guys financially support through scholarships and other means and you guys are the community that that mom and that student and the 60 other students get to feel seen and accepted and loved by. And I'm just so thankful to get to be a part of this community and all the things that we get to do in the lives of students and our middle schoolers are actually going to camp in two or three weeks and to know that we now get to do that in their lives too. So if you would please join me. We're going to pray for that and just pray for this morning as well. God, thank you so much. Thank you so much for every student that you entrusted to us and for every leader who bravely showed up and selflessly loved them, God. I'm thankful for this community and I'm thankful for the love that you've laid on every single one of our hearts to show up in these ways. Thank you for how well you love us, and I pray that you'd give us the bravery to continue to step into opportunities to show others your grace and your acceptance. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let us stand and worship. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song. Deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear, I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave. I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born. Your family, your blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of 
the daughters of trust in him his grace is so powerful and healing it provides comfort you have your forgiveness of shame he will never forsake us so let's rejoice in his goodness my 
my heart now and forever my soul cries out here I stand high and surrender I need you now hold my heart now and forever my soul cries out here I stand high and surrender I need open our minds and our hearts, Lord, as we continue on with this series, Baseline. And may the study in Galatians take us further into our journey with you, Lord. We give you all the praise and glory. Amen. Well, good morning. Wasn't that great? That was awesome. And uh, good morning to all of you who are joining us online. It's great to have you a, a part of this. So we're in this series on uh, Galatians. We've been kind of working through it. And, um, and if you've been here through this series, like one of the things that you'll see is Paul uh, keeps pulling us toward and uh, like infusing this idea in our hearts and our minds that uh, as followers of Christ, like there's a different way that we live. And primarily this way flows out of this understanding that we are guided, that we are taught, that we are led through faith by Jesus, that, that, that he's actually walking us and leading us through life with this understanding that there are, like, there are moments where, uh, because this is such a relational dynamic compared to like, what they would have understood before this, that like, there are always going to be times where we're going to get stuck, we're going to struggle, but there's this aim, right? Anytime I ever get stuck, anytime you're just like, okay, I'm, I'm struggling to know how to move forward, you'd always say, let, let love be your aim. Let that be a way that helps uh, move you forward uh, in this. Um, and to help us understand this, right, there's this idea that he's been talking about, about but we're not abandoned uh, to this thing. It's not like we're on our own. In fact, he says this. Let me, I'm going to read just a couple of verses um, that we've already covered in, in other chapters. If you look at um, chapter 4, Galatians chapter 4, verse 6, he says this. He says, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. We looked at that, I think, uh, like two weeks ago, that like, 
God is with us. Jesus is with us. And, and the point he's wanting to make with that is that as we navigate life, just know that you're not alone. Like whether uh, another way that he talks about this is that we are led by the Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit is in us and guiding us. That, that God is there in this whole thing. So this week, what I want to do is kind of look at the second half of chapter five or the last third of chapter five, because he kind of takes this in a more practical uh, direction in all of this. So if the spirit is in us, that is our guide. Look at what he says. Turn to Galatians chapter five. Uh, now look at verse 16. Here's what he says. He says, but I say, Walk by the Spirit. We looked at this a little bit last week. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Um, but what we all experience in this, right, if we're honest, is it's moments like, okay, I get the idea. I kind of get the paradigm. But there's always this struggle, right? There's these moments where, like, I... Like the thing in me that I know is the right thing that God's calling me to, like I'll struggle to get there. I get pulled away in temptation. Or I have this beautiful picture of how I want to relate to people and connect with people. And then I find myself getting frustrated with them and it's hard and we go through all this. Like what's going on with that? Like what do we do? And what I love here is uh, now starting in this next verse, he's going to walk out this dynamic that we all live in. And just help us understand, there's this dynamic occurring that's going on that we need to understand. And because this is a spiritual relationship with God, what, he's do, what I love about this is he's bringing this back to, he says, I want you to understand what's going on at a spiritual level in and with you. Because if you understand that, then, then you can walk through it holding to this way of faith with this aim of love. So look at verse 17. He begins to explain this dynamic. Verse 17 says, for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, right? There's this flesh thing that's going on. We've talked about that uh, in the past. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for they are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. And we've probably all experienced that. You're like, yes, there's a part of this where, like, I'm trying to step into my freedom in Christ in this new way and, like, and like what I really believe is good. And then it, it feels like it gets hijacked or hung up or, like, something, like, what's going on there in this thing? And he's just saying, the flesh, right, there's a part of this that's still in operation. And we've looked in the past where uh, uh, this idea, the flesh, that desire that comes from something other than who God really created us to be, it can pull us towards kind of like religious rule keeping, or it can pull us towards wanting to use our freedom in Christ as kind of a license to just sin in, in this thing. And it's like, we don't want to do those two things, and yet I find myself being pulled in one of those two things. And I love what he says here. He says, it's just because this is part of the struggle that you're going to go through. And then he offers um, just some practical insight that we can use if there's really this tension between the spirit and the flesh what he does is he says I, I want you to identify something and understand there's something working itself out in this and you need to understand this here's here's another way to think about how this tension works um i'm going to illustrate it through this uh, maybe nine ten years ago I traveled with a, a group from Casas, and we, were, we went on a trip to Thailand, a global trip, uh, where we took uh, nurses and a couple of doctors and uh, did these health clinics. Wonderful trip. Uh, the first third of the trip was uh, spent more in the southern part of, of Thailand and Bangkok. And before we left, we were going to go in a, more, a much more rural area after this, way up in the north. And uh, one of the families that we had been staying with it was like, I'm going to take you out to one of the, a wonderful place to eat. It's this street vendor. And we'd been, like, I'd been eating, uh, like, by street vendors the whole time there. And, you know, you have to be really, really careful. And I was really, you know, you, of course, you don't drink the water, but you don't even use ice because, you know, you don't know what little critters and bacteria are in the ice and those sorts of things. Um, so the next morning, so we ate uh, there. Then the next morning we get up and we get ready to go on this van trip up north. And somewhere between 90 seconds and three minutes into this van trip, I get this little pokey feeling in my lower stomach. And I'm like, ooh, that doesn't feel real good there, right? Um, and by the way, this is the beginning of a 14-hour van trip up north. Um, and apparently, uh, that night before dinner, and I figured out what had happened, was um, I picked up a little bacteria 
and uh, the stack of clean dishes at the, at the place, the vendor that we were eating from, uh, went through all of those, and then she grabbed a dirty dish, but washed it, and I watched her wash it right in front of me. It's just, um, it needed to be washed with like some scalding hot water, like those other ones were, but she skipped that step because I was standing there waiting for my dinner and just washed off one real quick and wiped it out. But you know, it only takes one little bitty, you know, bacteria to be a thing, doesn't it? And so uh, that little bacteria just needed, you know, dinner was great. I slept nice. It's just that bacteria just needed a little time to mature and become all that it was meant to be in this world, right? It just needed some time to gather up some of its friends and throw a little party in my guts, right? And so... Um, like five minutes later, it's just like, ooh, that felt bad again, and it got a little bit worse. And then, and progressively, it, uh, the, the moments got closer together and more prolonged and more painful until I was, I mean, maybe as sick as I've ever been. And we're on a van on the middle of a freeway, if you would call it that, um, and th- like 10 lanes wide, and it, it's, it's not like an American freeway. It is just solid packed vehicles just like flying up the road. There's no stopping for me at this moment, right? And my problem was not that I was going to throw up. Yeah, it was worse than that. And I'm just like, oh, you know, and I'm just like, and they're like, okay, we're going to get to a rest area. You got to hang on, you know, you know, five miles more, four miles more. And I'm just like, mm-hmm. so they, the driver goes, you know, flying into this rest stop that had a, a restroom in it. And, you know, the Doors opened up, and I flung out of there like a horse out of the gates, you know, at a horse race. Like, and I go running for the men's restroom. Only the men's restroom there, right? This is in the middle of Thailand in a, in a, in a somewhat more rural area. It wasn't a building. It was a picket fence. And on the front of the picket fence, and meanwhile, there's like 10 lanes of traffic driving uh, by. It's just a trough on the front of the, the picket fence, right? And so, you know, if you've got, you know, got to do number two, you go around to the back of the picket fence, and I'm just like, mm-hmm, and I go flying around the back of the picket sen- fence. There's no toilets. Uh, it's, it's like 20 or 30 squatty potties, just a pipe sticking this high up off the ground. It's all muddy because they have buckets of water where water's dripping into it to wash your hands after you're done. There's no toilet paper. Luckily, because I was with nurses and they knew what was going on, like they handed me a packet of wipes on my, on my way out, I fly around the corner and like all of, I call them stalls, but there's not, let's, we're kidding ourselves, right? It's just, there's like 18 or 20 guys using the squatty potties and there's like two little pipes available. And you know, normally I would fly around a corner like that and go, whoa, okay, now another time, right? I didn't even hesitate for a second, right? All inhibitions were absolutely gone and I lined up with the rest of them, right? Hi guys, hi guys, yes, yes, I know this is a very weird situation, very weird for me, but this is what's gotta happen right now, right? It's just like, and I'm just thinking, what, and this is now like three hours into this trip. Right? And I'm just thinking, oh my gosh, what's going to happen with the rest of this day? Right? So I go back, and uh, I'm halfway back to the van, and I have to run back behind the fence again. You know? Finally get back in the van, and, and they're like, okay, so we see what's happening. Right? That thing in you, it's just, it's, it just needed some time to become something thing else, right? Now, I share this because, like, that's kind of how, right? That's kind of how the flesh works. Like, there's little things, and, and what he's saying is, like, there's something that gets in there, and it begins to work itself out there until there's something evident that you can notice, for sure, right? But then, with the, with the, the nurses there, like, and I'm so glad I was with them, right? Of all the bad situations to be in, I was with the best group of people to be in that situation. Um, and we had some really strong antibiotics. And they're like, okay, you've got a little thing working on, uh, working on your insides. We need something else to start working on your insides now. And they gave me some really strong antibiotics uh, in there. And by the time I got to the end of that 14-hour trip, um, not that I was in great shape, but I was, I was moving in the right direction because that antibiotic started doing its thing and working within me until like I started to feel uh, better and was like coming back to life. And what Paul's, and I, and I share this story, okay, uh, somewhat graphic story, but I share this because 
that describes a little bit what happens between like the flesh and the spirit in this thing. There's something, the, the whole point is we, we don't longer live these lives by the outer markers or the rules. It's, it's about what's going on in the inside. And so what's going to happen here is Paul's going to actually walk through what we see as two lists of things. One is a list of what he just calls, here's the works of the flesh, right? Uh, the other one is here, this is the fruit of the spirit. And the, and the fruit of the spirit is a singular thing. It's love. But the list is now describing what love is, because right? love is that aim. And, and what he's saying is, Right? If you're seeing these things, it's because there's something in you that is like, it's, it's, it's been at work. It's doing something. But the antidote, right, the antibiotic to it is not license or law. The antibiotic is to walk in the spirit. And there's something about the traits of the spirit, the heart values of the spirit and of love that can be applied in this. So what I wanna do is I wanna read through his list of these two things, and I don't want you to read, uh, when we read these, I don't want you to think of these as judgments against you, I don't want you to like, uh, because that steers us in the wrong direction. Think of these as just, this helps me identify an issue. And now we're gonna go through the fruit of the Spirit, and now it's identifying how I can walk through the Spirit, walk with the Spirit in my life in a way that, helps deal with that situation. Does that make sense? All right, so let me read this, and then I'm gonna just walk through three examples right out of, uh, out of his list. So uh, look with me at uh, Galatians chapter five, verse 18, starting in verse 18. He says this, but if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, uh, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the alike. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this uh, will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. And here, and he goes on to describe it, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. So here, so like I said, what I want to do is I want to look at a couple of those things, or, or actually three of them, out of this list of what he says are like the works of the flesh. And just in a real honest way, without uh, judgment of others or self-judgment, I want us all to be able to go, ah, oh, yeah. There's maybe like a twinge or something there. But then to say, but he offers this other list of things. Is there something there that actually becomes the antibiotic, the thing that helps with this other thing that I might be going through over here? I, I, it just, I, w I just want you to see this in an ultra practical way because I think that's what Paul's trying to do here. He's trying to offer his help in how to actually live by faith and love in a practical way. So uh, the first one um, here, and this may seem like a strange one, but I want to walk through this. Um, idolatry. He talks about idolatry, and that may seem weird because we go, idolatry? Like, isn't, idol isn't that like when you worship like little statues or idols or like pagan gods or something like that? Yes, uh, that is a type of idolatry, okay? But understand this, what idolatry is at its core. I, we could define it this way. Idolatry is signing power to something or someone that only should belong to God. Let me say that again. Idolatry is when we assign power to someone or something um, that we should only assign to God. So back to like the little idols. Right? There'd be someone and they'd be like, oh my gosh, I, you know, I feel terribly insecure. We, I need more rain. The crops are going to fail. So I'm going to assign power to this little wooden statue to be you know, the rain god, let's say. And I'm going to worship it. I'm going to treat it in a way as if it has power to do something in my life. But it's not really God, is it? But I'm going to treat it as if it is. That's idolatry. Right? Now, here's how I think we struggle with this in our world today, is that you, you can treat a relationship in an idolatrous way in this. Um, and know that the context of what he's talking about here is all about relationships. This isn't just theological theory. He, he's talking about how we relate to one another in the church. So here's how this can happen. What happens 
when we look to someone else, oftentimes someone very close to us, and we say, you know what? You need to be responsible for my sense of security. You need to be responsible for my sense of happiness, right? We're putting a weight on that other person to be something in our life that, that, that doesn't belong to another person. No other human being is responsible for my happiness or my spiritual well-being, right? That, that belongs to God. I, I take on a responsibility. You take on a responsibility for that in your relationship with God. Um, there, there was an old Tom Cruise movie where he uh, had the line, you complete me, remember that? Um, so like after that movie came out, like everyone wanted that in their wedding, right? Like he just came in, I'd be asked to do a wedding. They're like, oh yes, and, we, and I want the, I, in the vows, you complete me. And I was like, oh, that's kind of sweet and nice. And then, then like I started processing it, looking and watching and hearing couples and struggling. I was just like, no, that's a terrible thing to say in your wedding. Like to put the, I'm gonna put all the weight of my inadequacy on you. You need to be the person that would make me whole in this world. And it's like, no, that belongs to Jesus. Jesus, not your, not your spouse, right? In fact, you start putting that kind of weight on your spouse, on your kids, on your friend, your boss, your employees, um, and, and you will damage the relationship. Like it will take it south uh, in a hurry in there. Um, and it ends up doing this. With it comes like these kind of weird expectations. Um, we become more critical, like, right? Just like a little bacteria that gets down there and it seems really nice. You know, you complete me, right? But then let it grow for a little while and it's like, I'm not feeling so complete. What, you need to get on the stick and start doing your job in this, right? That's the expectation that we start having. You need to change your schedule. You need to do different things. You like, and we start putting all of this thing and we start getting critical. And the thing that gets lost is the, the sense of happiness in the relationship. Like the joy goes, like we become I'm grumpy because we're living here and it's just like, why? I, I can't be what God wants me to be because you're not doing your job. And it just, and that's idolatrous in this. And so can I offer, I, I, so I look over at this other list that Paul has and there's something on there that I just say, gosh, this is kind of an antibiotic for this a, a little bit. And it's simply this, joy. Joy is this beautiful antibiotic in this. Um, there's something about joy that lets us see goodness beyond the circumstances. Joy, right? Uh, and this is a, and remember, this is a joy of the spirit. This is not the kind of joy that, that is just circumstantial, right? Um, take your kids to Disneyland, they're gonna experience joy, right? It's just because it's good, it's circumstantial, and there's nothing wrong with that. But what he's describing here is not that. What he's saying is there's a kind of joy that can come from God himself within you. Turn to that. Let that begin working a little bit uh, in your life. And it begins uh, bringing down that, that sense of criticalness. Uh, um, joy changes our perspective in beautiful ways. It can be really powerful uh, in this. Uh, uh, a funny story about this. Um, uh, there were uh, some researchers and they had two kids and they, and they were researching this thing about perspective on joy. So they get to the first kid and they said, okay, in this next room, there's a surprise for you and it's yours. Just like, just go in and it's yours. And the kid goes in and he opens up the door and in the middle of the room is a pony, right? And the kid walks back out and he goes, I can't believe this. This is terrible. Like, do I have to take this with me? And they're like, well, what's wrong? He goes, a pony? Are you kidding me? That pony's going to be pooping all over the place. There's going to be manure everywhere. It's going to be just a mess, right? Right? They're like, wow, that's crazy. Yeah. So then they say to the second kid, okay, you get to go in the next room down, and we have a surprise for you. But in this room, instead of a pony, they put like a five-foot pile of horse manure in the room, right? And they tell the kid, your surprise is waiting for you in the room. And the kid goes in, and he enters the room, and nothing happens. And they're like, what's going on? What's the... Like, they wait for a while. Finally, they go in and they peek in the door and this kid is standing right in the middle of this big pile of manure and he's covered in horse manure and he's flinging it everywhere. And they're like, oh, oh, what are you doing? He goes, oh, I figured with this much horse poop, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere, right? <laughs> yeah, it's all about perspective, right? And there's some, yeah, 
probably not a true research project, okay? <clears throat> um, uh, but, but the point is, there's something about being able to find a perspective of joy. And I, and I mean this in appropriate ways, right? There's, there's scripture talking about there's a time to mourn, there's a time to celebrate, right? But to lose joy, like it, it starts narrowing our perspective. It holds us back. So here's the application to this one, right? If you're struggling with this thing where you just, man, I, I see where I'm putting weight maybe in ways I don't want to put it on someone else in my life. And I, I need to experience joy, especially like in this relationship in here. here here's a simple a- application, right? If, if the Holy Spirit is in you, seek, seek the guidance and insight of the Holy Spirit. And one thing you can pray is you can say, help me to find joy that is already there. Because I guarantee you, there's a kind of joy that is already there. Maybe you're just not seeing it. You don't have that perspective yet. Just say, God, help me to have that. In a relationship, say, God, help me to find enjoyment in this other human being, this other person you've put in my life. Let me just, let me experience that joy. Learn to laugh with them. Uh, You know, not at them, but with them. Learn to laugh at yourself, right? There's something about joy, laughter, that brings our defenses down, opens our perspective right there. So let joy start working in your heart, and good things will start to happen. Uh, Next one here. Um, uh, And some of you, the way it's translated, it will say divisions. Others, it might say uh, factions or uh, uh, factions or divisions in there. Um, And uh, this comes from uh, the Greek word um, heresis. And it doesn't mean like, you, like you div- you're in the act of like dividing something up. Um, it, it's actually talking about the different pieces in it. So it's talking about like different uh, sects or parties or factions or different groups of people. This, was, this word was often used to describe those different groups of people that might be like in a particular party over here, different from this particular party or this different culture and how they see things from this one over here. Now, I bring this one up and I know you're going to really have to like use your imagination a lot because we just don't experience anything like this right now in our current uh, situation in our culture. But I want to just, you know, put on your imagination cap for just a second, right? And, and think about this one, right? What happens out of this? Why I think Paul talks about this is, is the idea is this is where tribalism goes bad. This is where that sense of tribalism or group or party begins to develop narratives about all the other different groups, and they become very narrow narratives. Um, They become narratives where you see a lack of character in that other group. Um, Narratives where you begin uh, to uh, think like they don't get it, or they can't understand, or they're incapable in all of this, right? And you see that happening. Now, I, I want us to not just uh, think of this in politics, right? I want you to think way beyond politics in this. Think about the dynamics in your neighborhood. Think about your social groups. Think about the different groups where you work. Think about, like, your school, like, your family even, where, like, and, and, we, and there are things that cause us to readily pull together, which is fine, until it becomes a bad kind of tribalism that starts creating these negative narratives in there. And ultimately what happens uh, with this, why it becomes this thing, is because we narrow our point to where we begin to see everyone in that group in a very overly simplified way, and they're all the same. We lose the sense of the humanness and the individuality that exists in those groups. You know, we went through a whole generations series. Remember that? And part of the reason we did that is because we don't, we don't want this to happen, that, that when we see someone of a different generation, that all of a sudden we're just believing those narratives because that's, that's the terrible thing that ultimately comes out of this. Good people, well-meaning, smart people, will actually begin to be- just accept and believe these overly simplified narratives that keep us from love, keep us from being who we want to be in all of this. So 
Um, here's the antibiotic in this, right? I look over at his other list and this thing. And he talks about peace. You know, the thing I love about peace is it, peace isn't just we all agree and there's no problems, right? Peace isn't the absence of problems. Peace is being able to hold on, or maybe a better way to put it would peace is the ability to rest in a kind of harmony that allows for connection. Peace is when we can say, okay, there's differences, but we, we can find the connection points. And it pulls me towards you. It allows me to trust. It allows me to rest or relax in something, in, in this. Um, peace has an element of letting go and trusting God. And when we work towards peace, like something good begins to happen in all of this. So here's my challenge, and, and I really mean this as a challenge, right? If you find yourself in that place where you're like, you know, if I'm really honest, you know, there's that group of people at the office, and I just kind of see them all the same, right? And, I, and I'm, I've gotten a little judgy with them for whatever reason. Um, here's my challenge. Find someone in your life, right, that's not your tribe, right? Um, find that person who, who you know, but, but you'd go like, they're not, they're not one of us in this thing. But be intentional about getting to know them and relate with them enough that you can begin to find something that you really sincerely appreciate about them. I really mean this, like, because we need this. We, we need to engage enough with someone, uh, and it's not that you have to become like that group. It's not that you have to believe everything that they believe. Like that, that's not what peace is. Peace is being able to connect in a beautiful and meaningful way that allows you to appreciate something about them that then kind of opens up your narrative a little bit. And you know, if you really do this, if you really find a way to engage this, um, you might find that it changes you in a beautiful way in ways that you didn't expect. Not like you're going to, you know, uh, become, you know, part of that tribe over there. That probably won't happen. But, you know, um, you might find that people who listen to, I don't know, like country music, people who own cats or even drive trucks or wear Birkenstocks are okay people, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you might find someone who has all of those qualities, and make a meme out of that because that would be something, right? Yeah. Um, engage in it and find the beauty in who they are. That, that's where the Spirit wants to lead us because that, that's following an aim of love. Okay, one last, one last uh, area. Um, on his list, he has uh, the word either, sometimes it's translated hatred or hostility in there. Um, some of you may have the word enmity in there, which is a really good translation. We don't use that word much, so we kind of, we, we don't understand the nuances of it, but that word really captures uh, the nuances of this. Um, and you might go, like, hatred, like, that's, like, whoa, that sounds too harsher here. But let me walk through this for just a second, because this one, interestingly enough, I think this one, what he's getting at here with this one, can happen in our closest relationships, in our most intimate relationships. Uh, here, ever notice that the easiest place to not bring your best, the easiest place to bring the least amount of energy when it comes to relating to someone else it are those that you're closest with? Like the place that you will hold in your frustration um, the least is probably someone like in your own family. But you know, if you're talking uh, to a new customer or you're talking at someone at the store or a coworker, it's like, okay, I'm gonna hold this together and I'm gonna be kind of, uh, I'm gonna be more kind and I'm gonna be more patient. And then we get home or we get with a friend that we're really close with. And it's just like, I just don't have the energy. I just don't have the energy to be patient. And because of our commitment and our relationship, I can afford, right, to just offer less energy on this front. And that just happens. Like, we can fall into uh, that. Now, it's not this terrible, horrible thing. But when it becomes a kind of pattern, it does something that can be uh, really unhealthy in there because, because it leads to this thing where subtly, subtly we can actually begin to think of that other person 
in a way that enemy soldiers think of other enemy soldiers. And that's what this word is getting at here. It's this idea that I can look at you with this very subtle kind of disdain. You're a little less than, you know? Pff, I know your weaknesses. Just get over it. Like, it just, think of how we hold impatience for someone that we're really close to. And that impatience can grow and move until it becomes this where it becomes this kind of subtle disdain uh, in all of this. And that's the word that he's using here. It's interesting. Uh, there's a couple that are marriage counselors, and they have become like world-renowned marriage counselors, and they've done a ton of research in this. It, uh, they're, uh, it's the Gottmans, if any of you have ever heard of the Gottmans. And they worked with researchers because they started noticing these certain facial expressions that, that they thought were connected to certain attitudes or feelings and sure enough they did all of this research um, and they came up with I think it's like 40 different facial expressions that are these like relational facial expressions and it can be something as simple as just angry right or it can be surprise or worry um, or a kind of suffering in this and what they found was that based on this they could and it, and no one's ever come close uh, to this and the Gottmans were the ones that kind of put this together and figured this out in doing marriage counseling and these are not couples that are like right on the verge of divorce but couples that are in, in a normal place of marriage counseling they could predict with I think it was somewhere around 97 percent accuracy which couples would not make it and their marriages would end in divorce and it was off of this simple thing. When we see, and, and I forgot like how the frequency of it, and it wasn't too frequently, but it is the single facial expression of, of uh, like disdain. That, and that's what this word is holding. When a married couple just like, oh, I like not just frustration, but there's like disdain. Like, you, like I just, I've lost respect for you as a person. Because all of these little judgments, all of these little things going on. And they coined this, uh, I think they were the ones that coined this phrase. It's called the, and it's a fancy phrase, but here's, here's what I want to talk about just a little bit. Uh, called the negative sentiment override. And what they mean by this is there's this, uh, this negative sentiment that comes out of like this sense of, of condemnation or uh, would be the other way they would uh, describe this. Um, and it, when, when the other person reads that off of their, the person they're in a relationship with, and again, you can take this past marriage relationships. It just, the, what I was reading on was with marriage relationships. You read that and it, it overrides all of these other things going on. And you instantly start reading the most negative possible response to the other person you immediately start assuming the worst possible narrative about that person, about their motives, right? He only said that because he doesn't care about me. That could be the furthest thing in the truth. It just may have been like he or she was just really, really tired. But if you get caught in this thing of this negative sentiment override, it overrides all those things and it literally changes your beliefs about that person that you're close with. And I've got to say, as I, the first time I read this, it was actually a, a years ago, um, I realized that what I had watched for 30 some years in ministry, I've seen this, where wonderful people get into a, a terrible spot where, where their relationship just gets ripped apart because they've started believing something about the other that's not true, but it is so real to them. But it was like a little bacteria that got down in that relationship and it just started slowly taking on a life of its own until it became this other thing that just is just deadly to a relationship. And by the way, just as a side note, researchers since then that started studying all of this, you know what they found? Um, if you get caught, and it, and it happens both ways. If, you're, if you are the one that holds someone else in disdain, what you get back, they're going to hold you in disdain. You're going to feel like it just becomes this vicious cycle. You get caught in that, statistically true, okay? Your lifespan is shortened by years, right? It doesn't just damage the relationship. It doesn't just damage your soul. It doesn't just damage you emotionally. It shortens your life is what they found. So when Paul says earlier, before this, he says, listen, don't 
do this because you will rip yourselves apart. You'll destroy yourselves. That's literal in this, right? But it's so subtle the way it comes on in this. So it hit me, right? Look over at, right, here's the fruit of the Spirit. And uh, he has two words over there, and I want to focus on one, but I want to distinguish it from another one. He has, he has kindness and goodness. And we kind of think of kindness and goodness as uh, being very, very similar. Uh, but there's a distinct difference in, in the Greek. Goodness is, think of go- goodness is what we think of as goodness. You do something that's good. You just bless the other person. And oftentimes we think of kindness as just, you do, you're being nice. But, but kindness here isn't about being nice here. In fact, uh, it comes from the root word in Greek that means to make use of or useful. So the idea is off of that root, this word for kindness means that you treat someone in a way that gives them value or worth or helps them to feel useful, like in a positive way. So here's the difference. It's not just being nice to them. It's treating them in a way that lifts dignity, that makes them feel like, oh, I have a place, I belong. You like, like you needed me, you wanted me. Like I like, see, that's kindness. And the reason I distinguish that one out of there is when, when this 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 other word that Paul uses over here that we sometimes uh, translate like hostility or hatred, is it is cheapening the other person's sense of value. Right? When we have a condemning facial expression, it's like we just pull the life out of someone. You know what we need to do? We need kindness to lift that back up. Do you see how it's, it's the antibiotic for that nasty bacteria that's condemnation and hatred and that sort of thing? Now, here's the other thing you need to know. Well, l- uh, let me get it to the exact application. Here, here's what I want to walk through is the application here, and I'll make this point that I was just going to make. So here's my challenge in an application fashion. First, um, if you see that happening in you, one, don't don't overly judge yourself and beat yourself up with shame on this. And here, like, to have regret over it is really healthy. To go, gosh, I'm doing this thing with someone that matters to me, and I'm just tired, I'm a little frustrated, and and for whatever reasons I'm acting out in this way, I don't want to do that anymore. Let it be there. Live in grace, right? It's a good thing to say, I don't want to do that anymore. But if you heap shame up on yourself, I promise you, you will have a short-term gain in how you treat that other person. But you will circle back around and out of your shame, you will become more condemning in it. It's how it works. It's why Paul says, stay away from that. So here's my first piece of, of application on this, and it's this. Own your part in how you feel in that moment, right? Because in that moment, so often we're just like, oh, that's just, if they would be on time more, like if they would pay attention, if they, we, we get into this thing where we are throwing all the responsibility on them. And so what I want to say so kindly is, without condemning yourself, own it. Just say, you know, regardless of what they did, right or wrong, I want to be kind. And that means I don't want to be lowering their value. I want to do things that raise their value. Just own it. It will be empowering for you in this. Secondly, ask the Spirit. And again, this is all about walking in the Spirit relationally. Ask the Spirit, right? Um, Can you remind me, show me, point out those beautiful, wonderful things in this other person? Help me see where I have changed my story in an inaccurate way, and I'm failing to see what you see in this person, God. Ask God to help you see that person for who they are in a new and beautiful way. Um, Third thing in this, um, and this becomes the challenge in this, ask Christ to help you find ongoing ways to treat them with specific acts of kindness. Make it a habit. And here's why I say ongoing in this. Here's what the Gottmans found. Um, we most often think, well, okay, we're going to do these things where we just, we're tired, we're frustrated, and and we, there's a little bit of, 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 you know, condemnation or a little bit of just like, you know, with someone. And and this is more than just frustration. This is thinking of it as less than. And let's say, you know, I don't know, it happens like five times throughout the week. Okay, fine. But, you know, 
Friday's coming and it's our, you know, we're going to go out Friday night and I'll do that really kind act. I'll say some really nice words and that'll undo all those five things that I did earlier in the week. Well, wouldn't it be nice if it worked that way? But it doesn't. Here's what they found. For every five instances where there's this, what they call that negative sentiment override, excuse me, for every one incident of that negative sentiment override, guess how many acts of kindness need to happen? Wild guess. <laughs> five, right? Five times the average person needs to, needs to experience five times of this beautiful kind of con kindness that neutralizes that one moment. So here's, my, here's, here's why I think he just says, kindness, let kindness just pour forth. If, so don't wait until there's one and go, okay, I'm gonna, okay, there's number three, okay, and I'll wait a couple of hours and then I'll, you know. What would happen if in the people we're closest with, our kids, our closest friends, our spouse, our parents, our kids, like, that we just said, okay, I wanna get, I wanna become habitual about just, Simple ways where I'm constantly pouring kindness into it. I am filling their cup with those things. And then in those moments where something happens, where there's that negative thing that happens, like, I, like I've already been blunting that. I'm already building that relationship up. Do you see how like that is walking in the spirit in this beautiful way, right? Find a way to make that habitual, right? Um, and this whole idea of finding our way of looking at these things and and letting this be our guide in this, that this is what it is to walk in the Spirit. Uh, Paul gets through this whole section, and here's how he closes it out. Look, uh, look at the second to last verse, verse uh, 25. He says, he says this. He says, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let that be your way. Um, why don't you stand, and I'm going to close this in prayer. And as I do, I just want to say, um, man, if you're a visitor here this morning, so good to have you here. I'm going to be hanging out in the front over here and off to the side a little bit. We'd love to just shake your hand, meet you this morning, and uh, personally uh, welcome you. And to the rest of you, I just want it, it is so good to be a part of a community of people that, that are excited and have passion for following Christ and letting him go guide us in this. Our world needs this more now than ever, doesn't it? Let's pray. Let's, let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much um, that I get to be a part of a community of people that love you with abandon and with passion. And I just thank you for the way I've been shaped by this group of people. And I pray that you would help us to be the kind of church that walks in the spirit, that we would, that we would help one another, that we would, the way we love one another, that we would keep pulling one another towards faith and love in you. And we pray this in your son's name, amen. Have a great morning. See you next week.